Rob from Birkbeck, who's going to talk to us about wheat measurements in the context of, of Bohm and, and uh, Wigner and Will. Let me first of all thank the organisers for inviting me here in the first place. And secondly, I think I ought to make a comment to begin with. Because I know that Bowman mechanics sometimes is greeted with in certain ways. I want to explain that the first 10 years I worked with David Bowman, his 52 paper was not discussed at all. Uh, one of the main reasons why it wasn't discussed, first of all, David Bowman wasn't that interested in it, and secondly, I didn't believe it. We were working on some very radical type of failures, some very radical new ideas, which we call pre-space. It was in the same time as Guido was doing his big geometry. And what we were interested in was trying to construct quantum space times from which we were going to get quantum gravity. Unfortunately, the program was a total failure. Anyway, after 10 years, somebody asked me about the, uh, the Bone 52 work, uh, why don't you and David Bone talk about this paper? And I said, because it's wrong. And then the student said to me, why? And I started mumbling something. He said, you haven't read the paper, have you? <laughs> and I had to confess I had not read the paper. So he made me go home and read the paper. And when, he read the, when I read the paper, I wondered what all the opposition was, because it seemed to be a perfectly interesting way of re-examining some of the formulation of, of quantum mechanics in a new way. And my main driving point was curiosity. Why is this working? What does it look like when we actually do calculations? And can we uh, get anything from it in that sense? I want to continue in that same mode, actually, because I want to look at these things called weak measurements. Now, I knew about weak measurements probably about 20 years ago, and Harnoff tried to explain to me what weak measurements were, <coughs> and I really didn't believe what he was talking about, so I left it go. And then, in the summer, several people came up to me and said, what do you mean by a weak value? And we have the weak value defined here. And then the question was, well, I understand the top part, why are you going to divide it by this strange bottom, which if you've got orthogonal um, wave vectors, it's going to be infinite. What the hell? What's, what's the point of this thing? And it was really my attempt to answer that that led me to suddenly realise that if you work out what these are, and I'm trying to explore what they are in special cases, you find that, lo and behold, what was known as the bone momentum is just a weak value. The bone uh, momentum squared was, the, the, was related to the energy and quantum potential. And I wish I could say that I actually spotted that, and it was spotted by my friend Rick Levins, and he never told me about it. Um, now, weak measurements are not of any, are not interest just in the, in the bone uh, picture. But in fact, there's quite a growing industry on using weak measurements to uh, measure different effects. And this particular one is a, what, what uh, they call the spin hall effect. And there are several others which I, I, I haven't listed because I haven't actually read them properly yet. Uh, I'll have to excuse me, I'm driving something that I, I'm not very good at driving. Okay. So what I want to do is, first of all, to explain how these, uh, the bone momentum, bone energy, and the bone potential can be uh, uh, worked out from, the, from uh, weak values. I also want to generalize the bone theory to introduce spin particles, and also, for the first time, doing the Dirac electron. And Faye, I do believe in quantum relativity, and this is only a limitation when the energy is below the uh, excitation energy for the creation. But it does come from field theory, actually. And then, 
What I want to do is uh, to combine the Clifford algebra with the Moyle algebra for reasons which I'll explain, where the Moyle algebra now can be dealt with with spin and in the relativistic context. And I have some acknowledgments here. Ernst Vinst and Maurice Gosson are two European brilliant mathematicians as far as I'm concerned. And Bob Callaghan and uh, David Robson, my former research students who try to keep me honest. Okay, so why am I interested in weak measurements? Well, I really started to take notice when somebody sent me this paper, which was a claim that this is a measurement using weak measurements, and it produces what looked like photon trajectories in two cities. Now, I was particularly interested in that because in many years Chris Judy and Chris Philippides had actually calculated these trajectories from the bone theory. And if you'll notice, there is a little bit of similarity, but not complete similarity. That's not surprising because here we're using the Schrodinger particle, whereas here you're dealing with electromagnetic radiation and you've got to be careful how you compare the two, the two different ideas. Now, the bone model, for those people who, uh, who are not familiar with it, arises in a very naive, simple way. It simply says, suppose I write the wave function as r e to the i s, where r and s are real values. Put it in Schrodinger's equation, what do I get? Well, I've got an equation with complex, which I can split into the real and natural parts. Nothing added. Look at the real part, and the real part is just this equation here. And if that Q was zero, that would just be classical Hamilton Jacobian uh, equation. Well known to people who studied planetary orbits at the turn of the last century. And what David Bohm did very naively was to say, well look, uh, we know from the classical theory that there is the energy, the canonical energy, which is given by minus ds by t, and the classical momentum is given by grad s, when s is the classical action, why don't we just carry over those relations and replace the classical action by the phase of the wave function? Okay, very naive, very simple. Why do you do that? Who knows? But the idea was to do that, if you do that, you can then carry over the classical ideas and you, by integrating that equation for a, a solution of Schrodinger's equation for two slits, these are Gaussian slits, you actually produce this pattern. Okay, so the ar argument, yeah, it's all very interesting, but how do you measure EB? How do you measure PB? How do you measure this thing, the quantum potential energy, which has caused a lot of problems, even though it appears as a far back was 1930. So just sent me a paper that Enrico Fermi wrote in 1930, in which he actually has the quantum potential there, and actually doesn't call it that, but it's there in the work that he was trying to do in those days. Okay. Now, how do you measure these weak values? First of all, let's see how you measure these weak values, because uh, that's the whole raison d'etre of my presentation, is that you can now measure the global momentum of the global energy. So what is a weak measurement? A weak measurement, and doing all of this in quantum mechanics, is you start with an interaction Hamiltonian where you want to measure the expectation of an, operat of a, an operator A on the system, and here the operator B for the um, measurement device. Then you start with initial state, all the standard stuff, solve your Schrodinger equation uh, with the following conditions that you normalize the way this lambda parameters that you're using, and you choose this psi d to be the eigenfunction of the operator b. So your final state is simply operator AB, and you work out the transition probability amplitude under those conditions. And then what you do is you expand, and then what you do is you pick out at one particular term here which contains your weak value, 
And then you've got the rest contained in these two terms here. Now the idea is, if this, can, if this is small, then you can essentially, by finding experimentally the, uh, the transition probability amplitude, what happens is you're, you're changing the phase of this wave function. So if you can measure that phase change, then you've measured this wave value. And this is what the experiment uh, that measures the trajectory <coughs> of the photon is doing. It's measuring the transverse momentum of the photon beam. Now, the paper that really convinced me that there was something in this is this paper by uh, Duck Stevenson and George Sutarsha. And I would rely on that because I know you, George, great guy, and it's a brilliant paper which actually gets rid of all the nonsense that, you know, it's just recording that, thing, <laughs> that Aronoff and Bateman were saying about all the genes, which put me off. And it was when I read that paper that I thought, yeah, there's something in this. Okay, now, if you post-select this B to be a position X, then what you find is, and you choose your detector wave function to be a Gaussian, then the imaginary, remember this, sorry, I didn't point this out, but this is not a, a value, it's, it's a, an imaginary number. And if you look at the imaginary part, then you shift the Gaussian wave packet in X space, but if you look at a Gaussian wave packet in P space, then the real part is the shift of that P space. So you can actually measure this, this, uh, these values statistically. Okay, so what's the difference? Normally when we talk about uh, measurement in quantum mechanics, we talk about what I call the von Neumann measurement, and that is you have a single measurement and it collapses the wave function. This is not a back collapse in the wave function. This is looking at something much subtler than that. In fact, what it's doing, I've drawn it there, is producing the phase change that this weak value introduces, produces a shift in the wave packet. So you don't have a one-off measurement, you've actually got to do a statistical measurement to, to find this packet, and then you can measure the difference between when the, the weak measurement is switched on and when it's switched off. Okay, well here's the particular experimental arrangement for these photons. I'm putting trajectories in quotes. I'm not going to discuss why I'm putting them in quotes, but I'm, they're not literal photon trajectories. So here's the apparatus. You have your photons produced with two Gaussian beams. You then polarize it. Then your weak measurement is simply a small calcite crystal which rotates the beam on a small amount. If you rotate it too much, you're not going to satisfy the condition that that term, which has to be smooth and smooth. So you've got to be very careful that you choose the right parameters so that that uh, uh, the second term, which I said was small in the previous thing, is negligible. Then what you do is you detect, you actually count photons here. Now, very quickly sketch, here's the interaction Hamiltonian, you're measuring transverse momentum, that's the momentum in this direction, and your uh, apparatus here is actually the polarization of the electron, of the, sorry, of the photons. Then here's solving your Schrodinger's equation, and when you go through the details, you find your transition probability amplitude has this phase factor in it, and notice here we've got we're selecting or we're post-selecting the position X for this. You then do your measurement and what you find is you measure this mean value that's related to the sign of this mean value of PX, the transverse momentum, and it's simply counting the number of right-handed photons minus left-handed photons over the sum of the left-handed and right-handed photons. So we're just counting things to produce this number. There's an XI there which comes in because of experimental difficulty. And here's the type of experiments you get. Here's the interference fringes in two cases. And these are the statistical mean uh, readings that you actually get for each position. So you average over these. Uh, there's some technical problems about uh, uh, 
correction factors in there, the usual sort of thing that the next theoreticians have a headache and it does have to be. Uh, and then what you find is that these curves here enable you, this, you measure the uh, transverse momentum and then you can construct these curves from that transverse momentum. Okay. Okay, let's have a look then and see how they appear in the formalism. And it's very easy actually. Take your normal expectation value and just expand it first of all in terms of complete orthonormal set. And then multiply by unity. You then take this part underneath there. There's your weak value. And so you see a weak value is just a term in the expansion of the expectation value. So there's nothing magical about it at all. And what you do is you post-select with this phi j. And that will give you a value at a particular point in your space. Now the special case of that is the very simple case where this weak value is just the eigenvalue. And that's when you choose the complete set of, of uh, eigenfunctions of your operator A. And I say, remember, this is a, a complex number. Now what does it mean in general? Well, this is where, to my amazement, I looked at this and I said, okay, let's, let's see what it looks like for the momentum operator. Hmm. So we, we post-select a position x on the wave function psi of t, and what is it? It turns out to be just that. Then write in the, the magic formula that we were always, whenever you see a wave function, you wanted to find out what Bohm says about it, just put r e to the i s. Hmm. And what you find is you get two terms, one is the bone momentum, and the other is an interesting term called the osmotic momentum. And this ties up with what Fay was talking about, the rate the osmotic comes out out of a statistical thinking about quantum mechanics of rise arising from some stochastic background. Then the bone velocity simply appears by notice the arrows pointing this way and this way. It's the sum of those two objects whereas the osmotic velocity is the difference between those two values. And because this bracket is very important, I actually discuss it in terms of one term, so I don't have to keep writing all this mess up. And then what you find is that the Schrodinger PXW plus is just um, this object here, and those people who know about field theory will realize this is the sort of thing we do for an energy calculation in field theory. And PXW here is just the derivative of the density. Now I want to make two comments, two remarks. First of all, go back to Ed Nelson when he was trying to get ordinary Schrodinger equation from a stochastic theory. He introduced a mean forward derivative, a mean backward derivative. This is well known in stochastic theory. You how to use these two things. From those you can construct the forward velocity and the backward velocity, and then the sum of the forward velocity and the backward velocity divided by two is just the bone momentum. And this one turns out to be the osmotic velocity, and Bohm and I discussed this way, way back in ancient history. Second comment, second remark I want to make, is I want to start with the energy momentum tensor. This is the standard energy momentum tensor. And let's have a look at it when we take the Schrodinger Lagrangian. And what we find is if we look at the T0 mu component, it turns out to be that expression there. And of course, it doesn't take you much to realize that T naught J is equal to, is related to the bone momentum and T naught naught is equal to the bone momentum. I only discovered that when I was doing the Pauli equation and when I was doing the Dirac equation. And in fact, this work of extending it, generalizing this whole uh, method to uh, Pauli and Dirac, you can find in Foundations of Physics paper that I wrote with Bob some time ago. 
And then if you look at the kinetic energy in these cases, here you find the bone kinetic energy and the potential. And this one gives you the osmotic term, which is an extra term, which I don't know whether there's any physical significance here or not. And it, it, to show it's just not my idiosyncratic approach to the theory that produces this, Lick Lemons and first name is, have already been there before me. Oh, and there's that quantum potential which causes a lot of discussion in the literature. It's there, it's not there, it's a load of nonsense. And once again, if you look at final lecture notes in physics volume 3, you will actually find that, that expression, and it, he calls it the quantum mechanical energy, and then moves on with it. So anything you want to Okay, now I, I want to, uh, to, uh, to go into something which looks as if I'm doing you know, the Monty Python now for something completely different. When in fact we're doing exactly the same thing. The Moyal algebra, the paper I studied, look at, notice it's before Bone. Bone was 52 and this was 49. And I was travelling on a train from Gothenburg to Vecchia, which is a three hour dreary train trip in Sweden. Even saw men walking on the water and the freezing water. <laughs> and it seemed to me that if the, the Moyal algebra was actually producing expectation values which agree with quantum mechanics using what appeared to be a uh, a classical phase space, and Bohm does exactly the same thing, they must be related to this. They must be related to this. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Now, first of all, we've got to be careful. This x and p, the p is not the momentum of the Okay, so let's do it formally, looking at the mathematics. There is this star product, and the star product is defined in this way. So that means, up, push it in, put this exponential in the star. Then whenever you see an arrow working this way, you work on the left-hand side. If you see it on the right, it works on the right-hand side. Okay. Just trivial. And now let's work it on the thing that threw me from years was that people wanted to look at this f as a real probability function in phase space. It's not. It's just the density matrix expressed in a different pair of variables. It's not expressed in terms of uh, x and y, two-point density matrix. Mm. It's actually, um, you write it in this form where x is this particular approach, the actual position, and P is something which we've got to find out what it is. I mean, I know what it is, but you can understand. Okay, so now let's work this out, and we'll see that clearly it's non-commutative. And in fact, what you do is you form two brackets. The Moyal bracket is the usual one that everybody knows about, and there's an h-bar under, I've got h-bar equal to 1 all the way through my much to Morris Gossel's chagrin. Why don't you put the H bars in? I don't like it because I've been brought up with H bars in the room. Okay, so there is the Moyal bracket, and you'll notice it's the, uh, just the gradient of this density uh, function. But you've also got the Baker bracket, which <coughs> is just P times this distribution function. Now, the secret of going from Moyal to Bohm is to look at the marginals because you're going from a phase space into a configuration space. And if you look at the marginals, that simply means take your Baker bracket, integrate over P, and what you find is this object here, and Moyal actually wrote it in the appendix of his paper with two bars on it, which is what I want to And he gives you expression for how to work out the p bar, the p to the power n in general. If you go through that and just put 
psi equals r e to the i s, we find that the moyo momentum is nothing more or less than one momentum. <coughs> you do the Look at look at this in terms of what I've done here. Oh yes, you then look at the Moyo, sorry, there's the Baker bracket, that gives you the bone momentum. You look at the Moyo bracket and that gives you the horizontal momentum. So these terms are already there in the mathematics. I'm not insisting we interpret them in any way or not. This is just a mathematical exercise. Okay, you then do the kinetic energy, let me quickly go through that. And then you find, in fact, it reproduces completely um, what you get in the bone case. There's a quantum potential. And the quantum potential is actually in Moyal's appendix in 1949. Okay, I'm doing a particular case here to keep the mass simple. It's just my m is equal to uh, one half. Okay, and then you complete the story in that way. Okay, so what, what have we done? We're interested in the meaning of these weak values and we're going to try, and, uh, since we can measure these weak values, then surely now we can make the bone theory uh, to a true physical theory in the sense you can actually measure mm. the bone momentum, the bone energy, and you can even measure, if all of this is true, you can even measure the quantum potential. So rather than being some sort of abstract thing which is using these variables which you can't measure. You can actually now measure them by means of these weak measurements. And then you find that the thing you want to measure are this, these, these brackets, and they're related to the Moyle bracket and the Baker bracket. They're also related to the commutator and the anti commutator and so on. And so then you find that the Baker bracket is just that plus. And I say just that, it's related to the, some, some conversion factors in there, but essentially that's what tells you what they are. Okay. Now, of course, the criticism is always You can't do spin, you can't do it. I blew up Simon Saunders just a couple of weeks ago and he said, You can't do spin with it. You can. In fact, Bohm did it in 1958, so I don't know what he was talking about. <coughs> relativity, no. So, it's relativity. Oh, so how are we going to do it? How's my time going to do? Well, what we need to do here is to get away from the standard quantum mechanics, and I want to go straight to Clifford Algebra's. You can do it in terms of Hilbert space if you want to, but it's much, much easier and much more meaningful to do it in terms of Clifford Algebra's. And you should do it. Every physicist should know that kind of idea. Because they do it in the they use it in the black thing. Okay. So what a beautiful mathematical uh, hierarchy in Clifford algebras. You've got down here 0, 1, and that's just the number of plus signs and negative signs in your metric. So you've got that four. And this 0 and 1 that just means there's one negative sign there. Here you've got three <coughs> variables with three pluses. And here, of course, you've got the relativity, which is one plus and three minuses if you're a physicist. And then at the top here, you've got the conformal. I put that in, and the generating elements here, their system may just go on increasing them. And those generating elements are defined by means of this product here, which you should know is the Clifford product. In fact, if I do this, what we've got here is a picture. Here's the Schrodinger and the Klein Gordon. There's another one in there which is actually the electromagnetic theory, which I've only just realized how to do before, um, since I made this slide. There's the Pauli, there's the Dirac, and there's the conformal. And just to make you feel at home as physicists, there's the Pauli spin matrices. So these are just matrix representations of these abstract symbols. Matrix representation of those abstract symbols. And to throw in, here's the twisters. And when I started with David Bone, we had Roger Penrose in the master department, and he was telling us about twisters. And I claim I, I contributed a great deal to the 
twister discovery because she came into my room one day and said, shall I spell the word twister E-R and O-R? And I said, no, O-R. <laughs> anyway, so you've got all that in this hierarchy. Okay, but, but wait a minute. Uh, what do I do? I, I, must have, I must have these objects. I must have wave functions. What you can do is you can replace the wave functions by minimal uh, elements of minimal left ideal. And the way you do that is you choose idempotence. And it's by choosing idempotence that you break the symmetry that you were talking about in one activity. And you also do the same thing for the, the, the bras, shall I call them, and you get the uh, a, a complex conjugate issue during Schrodinger. And now there is a one to one correspondence, well, that's called Clifford reversion, okay. Same idempotent. So now, how do we do the Pauli? Well, the Pauli, we normally have uh, two complex variables arranged in, a, in a, an array like that. In this approach, it's just that object there, and you take everything over the reals. I'm trying to wake Penrose up when he was in the lectures once, saying, Roger, you don't need the complex numbers for quantum mechanics, you can do it in the reals. But I'm cheating, really. And I'll tell you why in a minute. Now you can do the Dirac theory. Now, the important thing is the idempotent. And that idempotent just tells me I've got symmetry in my space, but I choose the z direction, and I choose the z direction that I have to. In relativity, what I do is I choose a particular time frame, a particular rest frame. So this works in every rest frame, but because this algebraic structure contains the Lorentz group, I can transfer into any other um, it's not manifestly covariant, but it is covariant. <coughs> and now I completed this by adding the Schrodinger equation, and this works because C01 is isomorphic to the complex numbers. Okay, now how are we going to do spin? Well, if we want the bone momentum, what we've got to do is to work out what this object is. And we can do that simply by using the left and right ideal with this derivative going both ways. And it turns out to be that. And then if we uh, choose our rhythm potent, which breaks the symmetry in a particular z direction by the magnetic field we're applying, then what you find is the Pauli current has two parts to it. And if you want the bone momentum, you've got to take the conventional, the convectional part of the current. Um, so now, just work that out, it turns out to be just simply that. You turn it back into wave functions and you find that the bone momentum looks like this object here and it's just that object there. Now, fortunately, to check whether we've got this all right or not, we can go back to the model that Bohm, Schiller and Tiongno introduced in, I think it was 1958. And they got the bone momentum of energy in that, it doesn't look anything like what I've got, but if you put everything in terms of the other angles, you'll get exactly the same. Okay, that's not a 55. Then you do the same for the kinetic energy, which means you can get the quantum potential, so there's the quantum potential calculated, all boring details here. Check it with the bone theory, and you find that when you do a conversion, to uh, Euler angles, and now what you can do is you can do the Dirac theory. I'm not going to do it here because I don't have time. So you can do a fully relativistic thing just by generalising. Okay. Now my claim is that I can that the Euler algebra is going to do the same thing as the Bohm theory. So the Euler algebra must be able to do spin. Now I've seen that one or two papers on spin. Maybe Angel will tell me it's all been done before in quantum chemistry. But let's take this density uh, um, element in the algebra. This is in the algebra. Right? All these things are in the algebra. 
Then the way you work out expectation values is you've got a, a trace uh, uh, and that equals the expectation value of the traditional sense. Now then I want to do something different. I want to take a density operator or a density matrix or a density function at two different points. It's like a propagator. Then what you find is that if you uh, extend this to the Moyal theory, put in your values for your x and y here, and this is this is what tells you that your x is not the position of the polygon, it's the position of the mean of two points. It's as if we have a quantum blob. And that's what Morris is always going on about. The quantum particle is actually a quantum blob. Okay, so then you get the Pauli algebra, you do that, you form the Wigner cross section, uh, cross Wigner function there, uh, and then you've got a lot of tedious work. I don't want to go through this because it's using Baker brackets, Moyle brackets, using the star product. You do the whole thing, and in the end, you find that here is the bone momentum that we calculated in the previous, and here is the uh, quantum potential. But I've generalized the Moyal now to include spin. And of course, if I can do it with spin, I can now do it with altitude. With <coughs> okay, and that's just pointing out there. Okay. Now, I just want to finally do this time development operator, because this is what you chemists haven't got. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. What we want, what normally is done is this is treated as an eigenvalue equation and two equations are obtained from this. I want to find out what the time development operator, what the time development equation should be in um, the Moyal theory. Okay. Now, what you find is that you get, by adding and subtracting these, you get the Moyal bracket coming in here. And if you go to the limit of order h, you get the classical Lugler equation. So the great thing about the, the Moyal algebra is that you do get the classical limit by going to all that h power. Now you do the same for the uh, well that's the difference. You do the same for the sum, and when you work it out, I'm sorry, I've left the details out here. What you find is that order h bar you get the classical relationship to the equation. Now then you can do exactly the same in your operator formalism using this as the density operator and you'll notice that you don't see any quantum potential in this at all but if you go to a representation then this equation produces that equation with quantum potential. In other words it's coming from these two equations. And I think these two equations are that analogous, I think in mechanical theory terms, you'd say there's a functor between these two structures. Okay. Okay. So that ties up the theory, so let me just summarize. Remember, the reason why I calculated these things is because they're weak values. And if they're weak values, and if we can measure them in the way that's been suggested, then we can measure the bone momentum, the bone energy, and the quantum potential of non electricity particles, spin particles, and for particles. Provided the energy is below the pair production threshold. <coughs> okay. What are we, oh, yes. Another way of looking, just to, to say the weak value, we're really measuring the components of the energy momentum transfer. Okay, so we've got those experiments. Okay, so this is uh, weak measurements open up the bone model to experimental investigation, and we can see whether it's correct or not. Oh, sorry, if it reproduces the effects that we're expecting from there. Um, so we can include spin and relativity, 
and the, the Moyal algebra is isomorphic to the Bohm model. The reason why I, I was led on to this was because I was in a conference in, uh, oh, I forget where it was now. And um, John Barker said to me, he said, it's very funny, he works on uh, nanotechnology. He says, it's very funny, whenever I'm talking to the group and I say, oh, you deal with this, with this, with the uh, uh, Moyal approach, and they all think, oh, very He then says, but you can also deal with the phone theory, and he said, it looks as if they're all really well. It's silly, because they're exactly the same. They are isomorphic things. Okay, with that, I have a little anecdote I will call it. Oh, Sorry, I'm taking over. Uh, Basil, your that osmotic momentum looks like a gauge potential, a singular. Oh, I haven't looked at it that way. Yeah, but maybe. You know. Yeah, maybe we should. I, I, I say, I only put this together in November. Oh, really? Before that, I had no idea what well, it was. Well, I take still a don't know what I'm talking. You know, about. you know, Frank Will Frank Wilczek uses that kind of trick in his anion okay, stuff. Good. He has an effective. We talked about anions. He, and uh, climate, climate, you know, has stuff like that too. You might look at climate. Well. Well, nobody, nobody understands what I'm talking about. I do. Or else it's a trick. Okay, cut the leaves. Well, it just to, to make sure I've understood first of all, so that with these, these weak value type experiments involve research and the oscillation. So the way you were doing things, um, we, we, pre, we can pre-select on any state, is that right? But you had post-selection on position. Yeah, well, well you pre-select by the actual input. Yeah. Whatever sure, that's input whatever you prepare yes. for. That means But were you assuming a particular post-selection? Yeah, position. I was position, 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 position in this case. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Um, no, it probably was clear. I was just making sure. Um, and then... Can I go back to the experiment? I mean, if, if you generalize that and then do an outpost selection or something else, does that have much to say? Or does it no, I, I, I really, I'm sorry I haven't investigated it. I was so busy putting this together. <laughs> I, I say this is the event last November. Oh, okay. Got this, and I'm still thinking about things. I'm uh, sorry, I'm not as nice quick as I used to be. I have a couple more quick points. Yeah, quick, I mean, yeah. so, something else that Aronov and Biden and people talk about is various paradoxes. Right. Associated with pre and post selection. So, this is not necessarily weak values. No. Um, there was even something quite recently involving the, the, the main doctor of Cheshire Cats. Yes, I know. Um, I, I, I haven't followed them because to me, when I heard, oh, yeah, I this. Yeah. When I heard them talking, I, I, I thought, no, this is Or I haven't understood it. And I say it wasn't until I saw the Sudarshan paper where they actually went into the idea of weak measurements from the physicist's point of view, right. discussing all the different things purely from the physics. And I thought, oh God, this, is, this has got something. Mm -hmm. Okay, in other words, you've got to make sure there's a lot in, in, in that paper by Sudarshan that you've got to satisfy before you can say it's a weak measurement. Mm -hmm. And that depends upon the experiment you're doing and some of the experiment situation. But it seems that by the, the papers that are coming out, you can do it in, in quite easy. Hmm. In, this, in the case of the trajectories, it was just a little slither of a council. Um, can I ask one more very quick? Yes. Unless, unless there is well, some else. Okay, well, um, if, if Bohm is just slightly out of equilibrium, let's say, and I mean the distribution of the positions, slightly different from... Yeah, but now you're taking me in to talk about the Bohm interpretation. I don't know whether I destroyed the Bohm interpretation or anything. Yeah. Okay. Because I'm going into the algebra. What I'm really doing here is I'm looking at a non-commutative algebra. And my feeling is, that if you're going to do something like quantum gravity, you've got to take this non conductivity into account, and you've got to go down the line with people have Alan Pomegranate and get non commutative changes. And I think this is beginning to talk about non commutative structures. 
and that's very different from Bohm. The Bohm's theory to me is, I've said it once before and I'll say it again, it's a Mickey Mouse physics. Right. Unfortunately, one of my students, Chris Tudor, got very upset with this. <laughs> I've made my career on Mickey Mouse physics, thank you very much. <laughs> Well, on that note, <laughs> 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 <laughs>